have, we're right now, for my class, we're into community corrections and prison. And we have a guest speaker today. He is the director of all prisons and department of corrections for Colorado. Director Ramish has uh, been the director for the last five and a half years. And he's going to talk to you about issues concerning corrections. I posted uh, for you benefit the audio lecture for the next two chapters that are available on Canvas. So next week we'll start with chapter 12. Uh, if any of you needs form signed for your community corrections class, I'll be in the back and after it's over, just come see me and I'll be happy to sign your forms. Thank you for arranging. Good morning. Not sure if this is going to work. We'll, we'll see. Uh, let me give you a little bit of my background. I uh, <clears throat> born and raised in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, for one and a half years, I was a deputy sheriff there. For the last seven and a half of those years, I was an undercover narcotics detective and also would investigate drug related homicides. The last four of those years, I attended the University of Wisconsin Law School. When I graduated on a Sunday, the following Monday, I joined the Dane County District Attorney's Office as an assistant district attorney. Did that for a while, then was recruited to become an assistant. U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Wisconsin. Did that for a bit and then was recruited to put my name in to become the Dane County Sheriff because the previous sheriff was retiring. I did that uh, for four terms and then uh, went into the private sector for a while. When 9-11 happened, I wanted to get back into government. I ended up as the Administrator of Probation Control for the Wisconsin Department of Corrections. Much bigger system than here. There were uh, here I have 9,000 parolees in Wisconsin. There were 75,000 uh, probation parole, um, 22,000 inmates, 1,000 juveniles, and 25,000 registered sex offenders. I was administrator for a while, and then became second in command of the Department of Corrections. Did that for a couple of years, and then the governor appointed me as uh, the head of corrections. He was hired by Governor Hickenlooper to reform and to move Colorado Department of Corrections forward. And what he saw when he got there was the overuse of solitary confinement. Solitary confinement is, at least in Colorado, you would sit in a cell by yourself about the size of a parking spot 23 hours a day, Monday through Friday. 48 hours on the weekends, and sometimes for over 20 years. At the time he started, there were 1,500 offenders in solitary confinement, which was about 7% of the population, which was nationally very high, very high average. In horrific irony, one of the people he was trying to help was an individual white supremacist mental health issues, been in segregation or solitary or the hole or whatever you want to call it for about seven years, and then was released directly into the community, behaved himself for a while, then cut his electronic monitor off, the alarm went off for six days with nobody answering it, got himself a handgun, ordered a pizza, the media called the gentleman and deservedly so, a pizza deliverer. He actually was a father of three. His full-time job was with IBM. And when he delivered the pizza to the murderer, the murderer had him tape a rambling statement about the evils of solitary confinement, murdered him, threw him in the truck or the car. We believe took his uniform, pizza uniform, took the pizza, went to Mr. Clements' home, and shot him dead. He died in his wife's arms. Uh, the murderer was later killed in a shootout by the Texas Rangers in, uh, in Texas. So I got my job the worst possible way. Uh, one of the things that I never understood and still don't understand to this day, or at least justify it, is how can a alarm go off for six days with no one answering it? And I might add, to finish the perfect storm of that horrible story, it was determined after Mr. Clements was murdered that a clerical courtroom error allowed the murderer to be let out two years ago. 
And so basically what the media was saying was that the department was so incompetent they got their boss killed. Now, when I checked into how someone doesn't answer an alarm when it goes off for six days, um, there, there's no excuse for it. But once I found out what was happening, I understood it. False alarms were going off in the parole division 12 to 14,000 times per month. So talk about crying wolf. So, the department's without a leader. He was doing reforms. It would have been so easy for the governor and for politicians to say what he was doing was wrong. We're going to crack down. They're going to go back to the heavy use of solitary. We're going to end programming. We're going to lock them up and throw away the key. And that's not what happened. What the governor decided to do to his speaking about his courage was to continue those reforms and expand them as much as possible. And that's simply why I was hired, was to do those reforms and to continue. You know, I, managers, and I have led and managed organizations a good portion of my life, and from a management point of view, we always know get as much input as possible. Surround yourself with people that are a lot smarter than you are and move forward getting a lot of input from everybody. But once in a while, once in a while, you have to do that. And Henry Ford, there's a bit of debate whether that quote was attributed to him or not. But prior to automobiles being invented, when he was starting to put his plans and blueprints together, he was asked, what would people want He had asked him, and his response was they would have replied faster horses. And the point of that is, is that sometimes you have to have a vision, and you have to say, this is where we're going, because I know this is the right way to do, do it, and we're going to do it, period. And that's what I did. So in the state of Colorado, there's a solitary cell. Size of a parking space. Seven feet by 13 feet. Can you imagine any one of you sitting in there 23 hours a day for 20 years? Let me just kind of sidetrack a little bit and talk about the American prison system. And I'll talk more about the prison system, although today mainly is about our reform in, in solitary because we do lead the nation in many countries in the, in the world over our, our reforms. But I have visited some of the European prisons, Sweden uh, particularly, and it became very apparent to me that the difference between European corrections and American corrections is Europe invests in corrections and we invest in efficiency. And there's a good example of efficiency. How many of you would sit in an apartment or your dorm room or your home and you would rent it or buy it if your toilet was attached to your sink. You better hope you and your roommate don't want to use both at the same time. Or how about every time you want to wash your hands, you got to lean over your toilet to do it. But better yet, if you want a true experience about the way we treat those that are sentenced to prison, Tonight when you go home to make your dinner, make it, and then go sit next to your toilet and eat it. It's disgusting. If you are a correctional officer in Norway, and you're my Norway correctional officer's first day on the job, you are trained for two years before you work full time in a Norwegian prison. I just addressed my recruit class of 140 yesterday. And I mentioned that to them, and then I told them, I hope you learn a lot in the four weeks that we have training. It's disgusting. So, you know, if I were to use the term outdoor recreation, I don't know what comes to your mind, but what comes to my mind in outdoor recreation in a prison setting is a big fence, maybe two fences, 
courtyard, basketball courts, weights, soccer field maybe. That's the Supermax Prison, Colorado State Penitentiary Outdoor Recreation. And when I arrived in Colorado, I was told that two years before I got there, that was declared unconstitutional. And what went through my mind was, why the heck do I have to fix everything? <laughs> now think of that. There was one gentleman that I talked to that had been in solitary for 15 years. If he wasn't standing now, 23 hours, remember, you get one hour out a day in that cell. One chin up bar in a parking space with those slats in the wall. So if he wasn't standing in the exact right spot at the exact right time, the sun never touched the skin. And I can tell you I'm over exaggerating when I say that the skin was translucent but it was the oddest color that I ever seen in my life. If you don't think that you as an individual can make a difference, all I would ask of you is to be relevant, no matter what you do. When we started our reforms, and we started that basically in 2014, we were doing a newsletter that we sent out to all of our 6,500 employees, telling them what we were doing. We had all kinds of committees that were giving input on our, on our reforms. And prior to our reforms, there were two types of, of segregation or solitary in the Colorado prison system. One was punitive, so if you violated a rule, you could spend up to 90 days maximum in punitive segregation. But then every state had what we called administrative segregation. And our policies, to show you how this kind of gets to abnormal very quickly, all of our policies in all states, the first policy said a person can be placed in punitive segregation if they're deemed to be too violent to be in the general population of a group. Makes sense. Perfect sense. But then, we had a caveat policy that said, and or anyone who's deemed to be too disruptive to the efficient running of an institution. Isn't that kind of inmates' jobs? It's kind of what they do. And the point is, they could be thrown in there for any reason at any time. And because we had what was called a level system, and I cringe when I hear they earn their way in so they have to earn their way out. A level system is this. All states had it. We threw ours out. If you're in solitary confinement administrative segregation, and that segregation can go on for your lifetime um, if you don't earn your way out. You go through level one and there's different things that you have to accomplish. It can be a month or two months or whatever. It can be a year. Then you go to level two, then you go to level three, then you go to level four. But by the way, if you have a bad day in level three, and I know no one here, including me, has ever had a bad day, you go right back to level one. And that's how one month turns into one year, turns into five years, turns into 10 years, turns into 20 years. They can't get out. Now, when I got to Colorado, as part of the what I wanted to do with Walk the Talk was I'd been in solitary cells in the criminal justice system many times, but I'd never spent three shifts in one as an inmate. And so in our Supermax prison, I went in and called an RFP, which is the move for population, and was taken in in chains handcuffs, leg like chains, belly chains, just like a person would be, uh, put into a solitary cell under RFP status, which is called, means removed from population, which meant I went in there with nothing, except some sheets of paper with some regulations on them, and an institutional pen, which is about 
like that, kind of like holding a piece of licorice, supposedly, so you can't harm yourself with it. You can't. And was going to do a story on it for our newsletter. So I went in, did the three shifts, came out, wrote my notes up, told uh, uh, a policy advisor from the governor's office, I said, take a look at this. This might have a few more legs than, than just a newsletter. And he read it. He got a hold of me. He said, oh, yeah. And, uh, he said, where do you think it should go? And I said, well, the New York Times has been covering the overuse of solitary confinement for a couple of years, but it hasn't been going anywhere. And I said, let's see if they want it. Oh, they want it. And I knew the day it was going to come out. But what I didn't realize was that no one in my position had ever done that. And so I knew, obviously, when the the time the story was going to come out of the day. But at 10 o'clock that morning, that policy advisor called me and said, Rick, I've never seen anything like it. And I said, what? He said, virtually every major city in the United States has printed that article. And there are those that say that that article and what I did started the debate on the overuse of solitary confinement in the United States. Today, there are about 60,000 inmates in solitary confinement in the U.S. It was 80,000 a few years ago. And I say it didn't start the debate, but it sure threw a hell of a bucket of gas in the And away we went. And for bureaucracies, what I did when I got to Colorado is I asked a few questions because I distrust bureaucracies. I want to tell you that right now. And the reason I do is because things that are abnormal become normal. So I started asking questions. The questions I asked myself was, at what time did it ever become OK to lock someone in a cell for 23 hours a day the size of a parking space for decades? And when did it ever become OK to lock someone in the cell that I just described that was seriously mentally ill and let the demons chase them around in that cell? And when did it ever become OK to take someone who had been in one of those cells 23 hours a day for years and release them directly into the community? When I got to Colorado, I heard stories about it always takes two officers to remove someone from solitary confinement for safety reasons. And I heard stories of two officers taking someone out of solitary, getting them in street clothes, putting them in belly chains, leg chains, handcuffs, doing the inmate shuffle. And I call it the inmate shuffle because you can't do a full stride when you're in leg chains. Putting them on a city bus taking the chains off, and the officers would get off the bus. And you know, I say if I was the bus driver, I'd stand up and I'd look at the rest of the customers on that bus. And at the top of my lungs, I'd scream, right! They hell's the matter with them? Plus, I just woke you up. <laughs> That's crazy business. Our mission is public safety. Can anybody in here explain to me how that's public safety or anything? Why don't we just stamp return to prison on their forehead? Because they're coming back. You know, the data now is so overwhelming <coughs> that putting someone in a cell like that for even a short period of time damages them. So our mission of public safety, we were putting people back in the community worse than they were coming in. And 96% of the prisoners under our custody and care return them back to the community. 96%. So how do you want them to come back? Prepared or ain't? Neuroscientists that I've spoken with have said the brain begins to almost misfire immediately when you're in involuntary solitude. And I've been, as a result of our work, I've, I've been on international and 
international panels all over the U.S. and many countries. And so I, I sit in here and listen and work with these experts. These neuroscientists asked me to be on an advisory council because they were going to be doing a study on long-term involuntary isolation. And I said, yes. And then they explained to me that they couldn't use humans. It's against their licensing to, to evaluate and test humans that are in custody. So they were going to use rats. And then they started to explain how the rat brain is somehow similar to the human brain. And I automatically cut that off because I wasn't going to believe that for a minute. But that's what they believe. Then they said, but to use rats and to isolate them, we have to get special permission to do that. So we treat rats better than we treat humans. I talked to one psychiatrist who has spent his lifetime to become a friend, a friend of mine. Spent his lifetime evaluating, studying, and fighting against long-term segregation. And in Pelican Bay in California, and I don't know if you know anything about Pelican Bay, but it's a supermax prison that if you are identified as a gang member, you do all of your time, at least up until a few years ago, in solitary. So if you have a 40-year sentence, you get 40 years in solitary. And some of those cells of Pelican Bay have no windows in them, and they're double door. So a decade or so ago, he went out and evaluated and interviewed some of them. And then a couple years ago, he went and did the, did the same thing. And he said that he has found their degree of loneliness in only one other group of people. And of course, I asked why, or who, and he said, terminally ill cancer patients. And that's what we're doing to human beings. So we developed the philosophy, just open the door. We control it. The evidence that long-term isolation either multiplies or manufactures mental illness is there. And it's not just the physical harm and the neurological harm, it's the physical harm. I was on a panel with a gentleman named Albert Woodfox. I probably don't know and shouldn't know who Albert Woodfox is. I think he holds the world's record for being in segregation. 47 years in Angola, in Louisiana. And he was saying that, he's out of prison now, uh, he was saying that anywhere and any time he's in open space, he gets lost. Because he can't focus with long-term vision. And how could you if you're sitting in a parking space for 47 years? Your eyes don't work anymore. And can you imagine someone my age, the muscle deterioration that I would experience being in a cell like that. It's horrible. So it's not just mental, it's physical, it's neurological, and we have all that data now, and it's overwhelming, yet many states still use long-term solitary confinement. Many states still release directly into the community. Many states still put the mentally ill in solitary confinement because they're so disruptive. We have two facilities that are dedicated, prisons, dedicated to those that have mental health issues. And if you want to know what the Colorado makeup of our inmate population is, we're the largest mental health institution in the state of Colorado. Over 30% of those sent to us have mental health issues. Over 10% are seriously mentally ill. We run the largest drug and alcohol treatment center in Colorado. Over 77% of the offenders sent to us are addicted to drugs, alcohol, or both. Most enter with an education level between the fifth and the seventh grade. That's the makeup of the Colorado prison population. Colorado State Penitentiary. You know, people that haven't been in prisons, they, when they talk to me, they go, I want to see a Supermax. A Supermax prison is built to hold, hold people 23 hours a day, period. So in a Supermax, that's pretty much what you see, nothing. 
you see anything, it's there, the inmate shovel. Now, you may not see much, but you hear things. You hear screaming, you hear yelling, you hear banging. The things you do see, if you happen to be near those small windows on the doors, you'll see someone throwing their face against the wall. You'll see them trying to harm themselves. <clears throat> they're screaming obscenities. Or they're cowering in the corner. That's the American prison system. So what we did with our two facilities dedicated to the, uh, those with mental health issues, <clears throat> we developed a national model which is called, <clears throat> excuse me, the 10 of 10 program. Those that were previously in solitary confinement, we would bring them out for 10 hours of individual therapeutic treatment and then 10 hours for other activities and it became incredibly successful to keeping them out of, out of solitary. Now, when I talk about my distrust of bureaucracies, when I talk about two facilities that were dedicated to those with mental health issues, very progressive, but not progressive enough that they stopped having solitary cells in mental health prisons, because they were there. And the seriously mentally ill, because they were so disruptive, we were kept there for years. And clinicians, mental health professionals, to show you how things go awry. And I was out at one of those facilities when I first got here, and I walked by one of those cells. There was a gentleman, obviously seriously mentally ill, smearing feces all over the wall of the cell. And I said, do you do that every day? Yeah. All day? Pretty much. Does he do it when you let him out of the cell? No. Huh. Let him out. So I banned solitary at those facilities. A really good sergeant emailed my deputy and said, you're gonna get someone killed. Six months later, I had a professor from Stanford who was doing some criminal justice reform, uh, writing for a book, wanted to see what we were doing. And uh, that same sergeant was there. And unsolicited, the professor said, so, with these reforms, that incidences drop. And the sergeant kind of smiled and said, yeah. How much? 80%. So, what you see if you look closely is the gentleman undergoing therapy at the table, but you can see that they are restrained to the table because they're violent. And the other philosophy we adopted was you can restrain, but you don't have to isolate. And the sole purpose of having them get this program in therapy is to get those restraints off of them and then get them back in the general population. And again, there was no, you know, when I talk about our reforms, I mentioned that not only was there no map, there was no road because nobody had done what we were doing in the state of Colorado. That takes courage. And it takes great staff. And it takes risk. And we did that because we thought that's the path we had to go on to get back to our mission of public safety. And being in Colorado now, if I was in Wisconsin, I'd have to say something about cows. It's very stupid, okay? But it's Colorado, so I get to talk about horses. You know, and you've all heard the adage, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink it. Yeah. Oh, that's not my philosophy. My philosophy is you take that horse, you pick him up and you throw him in the pond, they're gonna get some water just trying to get the hell out of the pond. And that has been the basis of our program. It's forced program, and it's working. And we're doing it in different areas, and that's working too. And to show you some of the other things that we're doing, 
in one facility where we had a fairly large number of assaults, we took all the bad apples and put them in one unit. Assaults dropped by 26%. Group therapy, cognitive, anti-anger, anti didactic, individual therapy, I mentioned that gentleman that had been in for 15 years, that's not him, but um, we had about 250 that refused to come out of solitary confinement when we opened the door. And we thought it would be way too ironic to go in and physically remove people we had probably physically put in there to begin with. And they were so, I'll use the term dehumanized, I don't know if that's a word or not, sounds good, they wouldn't come out. So we used three different ways to try to get them out. One was using our mental health experts. We used what we call at-the-door therapy, which is the absolute worst kind of therapy you can give in a prison because the last thing an offender with a mental health issue wants is having a therapist stand at the cell door talking to him with an inmate in a cell next door listening so that he can give him crap about him and the mental health. But it's the only way we could do it at that time. So it was the only thing we could do. The other thing we did, we called incentives. I called it bribes. We would offer them things to come out. Extra privileges, canteen items, more phone use, visitation. But for those that had some serious mental health issues, therapy dogs brought them out. That gentleman for that 15 years I had talked about, the dog brought him out, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, and I asked him why. He said it was the only constant thing I had in my life when I was a child. So they all have their, their stories. No matter what they've done, some of them terrible, terrible things. But we have a very large dogs uh, program in our system. Therapy dogs is just one part of it. We uh, have what we call a rescue dog program. The governor has one. Uh, dogs that are going to be euthanized, and we take them and we get them healthy and train them and, and sell them to the public. And then we have what I affectionately call the dog whisperer program, where uh, citizens that have trouble with their animals can bring them to us, and we will retrain them. Um, the dogs live with the with the inmates, and the positive effect on the inmates is. So that shows the decrease when we ban solitary at San Carlos. And San Carlos is our facility for the seriously mentally ill. And I mean off the planet, seriously mentally ill. So what do we do when we ban solitary? Well, we took solitary rooms at those mental health institutions and we turned them into what we call de-escalation rooms. And the cost to do that was about zero. Offenders uh, a lot of good artists, painted some nice murals with soft colors, comfortable chair, soft music piped in, blackboard and chalk if they want to write something, some de-stress materials in the room, and they are open seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And I know of at least one inmate that goes into those rooms every day, five to seven times a day. And that's five to seven times a day. He's not jumping on staff or other inmates. It's been tremendously successful. In fact, so successful that we have uh, put them in our prisons. So, you saw the Supermax. That's the same Supermax. We repurposed it. The longest amount of time that you can spend in solitary confinement in Colorado, the state prison system today, is 15 days, period. So we repurposed this into a, it's a high security facility. But there's nobody killing anybody in there. They're quiet, they're behaving, 
They're interacting with staff, and the majority of them have not been involved in any additional disciplinary infractions. The results are miraculous. Supermax because it's under So as a result of our reforms, we have a vacant Supermax prison. We have two in Colorado. One is the one you saw that was repurposed. The other one's almost brand new and it's empty. And it's for sales, and if any of you want to buy it, add <laughs> it. What I'm trying to do when I can't get the money is that I want to reopen that into a re-entry center and a receiving and discharge center to put a spotlight on what you can do with reforms that work by taking a supermax prison where everybody used to be locked up 23 hours a day that are now successful offenders. Our programs have been so successful that we now have at our, the Supermax we saw, we have employers coming in, hiring inmates prior to them being released, getting them jobs in a high security prison. We have re-entry units in those prisons where we teach them social skills, resumes. They've already had the job training, but now you have to understand Colorado, one of those states that had a juvenile life without parole statute, which meant if you were 16 and committed murder, <coughs> you could be sentenced to life without parole. And we have 44 of them in our system. And a good number of them have been in prison for over 40 years. So they don't know how to use a computer. They don't know how to use a washing machine. And so one of the things we're doing with that is virtual reality. Is the technology is so wonderful now that with virtual reality, we can actually you know, put the, the goggles on, and they can go through and do their wash, go grocery shopping, open a bank account, um, go through a job interview. It's, it's amazing. I, uh, we're at the end of this, of the slides, and I wanted to, to do this fairly quickly to answer really any, any questions about you may have about the correction system, but this is Canyon City. And I call this architectural suffering. When you come up on Highway 50, come up to the top of the hill and look down, that's what you see, concrete monsters. And I call it architectural suffering because and again, this gets in the, the, the difference between European systems and American systems, is that the way those prisons are built, steel and concrete, they manufacture violence. And picture yourself on a prison bus on the top of that hill and looking at that, and I guarantee you one of two things is going through your mind. You are either going to be scared to death or you are thinking, I'm going to be the meanest, baddest mother that ever walked this earth to get out of there alive. It doesn't give you that warm, fuzzy feeling like, boy, that looks like a building that's really going to help me when I get in there. There's no way. And I tell people, if I walk into those prisons and I see a pool of blood five feet in diameter on the floor, it doesn't faze me. It doesn't faze me a bit. If I saw it here, for the obvious, obvious reasons, concrete and steel, there's no ownership, they aren't healthy. And at Sterling, and I had a real bad incident at Sterling last night, um, had four officers severely beat. But at Sterling, it was 2,500 offenders. 2,500. And I walked through there, and I think, what the heck can I do with 2,500 people under one roof? Knowing full well, if I had 2,500 nuns under one roof 24 hours a day, they're going to start punching each other. That's what happens when you jam people together. And so my big thing now, I don't, I don't have 
time to do it because I'm leaving pretty soon. But uh, that's got to be fixed. We have to do everything we can to try and humanize these offenders more than we're, more than we're doing right now. Um, now let me get back to the Swedish system so I can mention mass incarceration and try and get a few questions generated. There is no question that we over-incarcerate in this country. 25% of those incarcerated in the world are right here in America. When I visited Sweden, the director there, Nils Ober, um, he and I have become professional friends. Nils has everything. He has what we would consider the county jail, the state prisons, and the federal prisons are all under him. Sweden has a population of 10.3 million people. They have less than 5,000 people in person. I just have the Colorado prison, state prison system. We have a population here, oh, I guess about 5.4 5 million people. Depending on the way you count our numbers, I have between 18 and 20,000 inmates in the state system. And I tell people, we've met a lot, I met a lot of nice Swedes over there, but they weren't nicer than we were in Colorado. The point is, we put people in prison for way too many wrong reasons. And I once, the director of Ohio years ago, I credit him for saying this, it's been used quite a bit, is that what we have as a society have to figure out is who's bad and who are we just mad at. And the people that we're mad at, we've got to figure something else out other than putting them in, putting them in prison. You know, the parole system here. Our recidivism rate in the state of Colorado, when I got here, was 50%, which meant I would walk into a room of, of inmates this size and I'd say, You got to prove me wrong. And they'd go, What? And I'd say, After you were coming back. Now it's like 48, 49%, not, not great. Not even close to great. But I can tell you what is great is that a number of states define recidivism in their state as if someone commits a crime within three years of release. Our recidivism rate, we include that, but then we also include technical parole violations. But our percentage of those that commit crimes within three years of release is 13%. That's incredible, that's really good. The rest are technical parole violations. That's on people like me. That means they have violated a the rule, they failed drug tests, they don't show up for meetings, they, uh, but they aren't breaking the law. And what we've been trying to change, what I've been trying to change from our parole culture is that we need to do more to try to make them successful instead of trying to catch them for things that they're, that they're doing wrong. You know, when I was a, a police officer, professor could probably back me up on this. The saying among us was, if you were a patrol officer, I could follow any one of you for one mile and have a legitimate reason to pull you over. One mile. And as a parole officer, it'd be very easy for me to say, I could follow you and track you for a week or so and I'm gonna find you doing something wrong. And when we put someone back in prison, on a technical parole violation. They go back for 180 days. That's it. Now think of that. If I were to take any one of you and say, okay, for 180 days, you're gonna sit right over there. What's gonna happen? You're gonna lose your partner if you're thrown out of your dorm. You're gonna lose your partner. You're gonna get thrown out of school or flunk out of school and your dysfunctional family is gonna become more dysfunctional. And then we're gonna put you back out on the street and say, hand in. So we've gotta, gotta rethink that, figure out, a, figure out a better way. Yeah. And we are. So, you know, the opportunities that I've had because of this, because of the great work that our staff has done, has allowed me to really travel all over the U.S. I've been before the UN, both Cape Town, Africa, and Vienna, Austria. I've been to Poland, 
Australia. Just got back from Canada. And all these opportunities because we're changing the criminal justice system in the area of correction in Colorado, in the nation, in many countries in the world are being forced to follow because it's, it's working. And it's a tool, the use of solitary, that should be taken out of the, out of the toolbox. You know, the whole thing started at uh, Eastern Penitentiary, uh, out east, by the Quakers in the 1800s. And they built the first supermax prison. And felt that if we completely isolate prisoners, the youngest one they had in their penitentiary was a 12-year-old girl. If we completely isolate that, and I mean isolate, where if they were, if they were taken down the hallway, they had a foot over their head or a chest cord. They saw no one. But they, and the, the idea was, if they're isolated, they'll self-reflect and fix themselves. And uh, unfortunately, what happened was they determined they weren't fixing themselves, they were dragging themselves insane. They stopped the practice and the rest was kept on. So um, it's a practice now that's, that's coming. <coughs> um, with that, I would like to uh, forward it up for questions. First, ask my daughter if I'm doing okay. Uh, front row that puts the pressure on. But uh, just, uh, how about some questions? Anybody? Yeah. What are some of the most common arguments you encounter when you're presenting your policies? Um, the most common ones or the biggest ones? Great question. Uh, what do you do with the most violent? That's a that's a main one. Uh, you know, when I talk about uh, restraining them versus, versus isolating, and it, the socialization is incredibly important. So um, I talk about how the use of restraints um, is not harming them um, like it is mentally if they're in, if they're in isolation. Some buy that, some don't. Uh, but what people do buy into is, I'm hardcore law and order. You, you heard my background. Uh, what I do, and the reason I, I've done this is to try and lessen the number of victims, to try and make it safer for my staff, which means it's going to be safer for the community. And if what I believe is that a long-term solitary is making them more dangerous when they go in, that if we're even ever considering letting them out, we better stop that practice because they're coming out more dangerous. And so um, people start to understand that. And especially when I talk about our mission being public safety and trying to assist these individuals instead of, instead of harming them more. Um, you know, understand that we have some folks that have done such terrible things. I have absolutely no sympathy. None, zero. Um, our death row agents, we only have three in Colorado. But we don't have death row anymore. Um, it takes years and years uh, typically to get a death penalty uh, one to trial then through trial and then after all the, the appeals to actually get an execution date. I've got one right now that they're seeking the death penalty and it's coming out of our budget because that's the way it's set up. It is costing us, you, $25,000 per month in legal fees and this has been going on and so we ended death row. They're out in our four hour out um, area. And, you know, I, I didn't do it for the death row inmates. I did it for our staff because uh, these folks are calmer now and, uh, and better, which means my staff is, my staff is safe. One thing I haven't talked at all about is, you know, I've talked about kind of the horrors of of what happens inside of the solitary cells. Uh, the majority of, of self-harm occurs in solitary. The majority of suicides occur in solitary. Uh, but on our side of the door, can you imagine eight to 12 hours a day sitting in those units, hearing people scream obscenities, kicking doors, throwing body fluids, 
harming themselves, and I'm talking harm you can't even believe. Suicides, and then you go home, and your partner goes, how's your day here? It sucked, it's horrible. And so now, we've stopped most of that, and the positive results on our staff is tremendous. I mean, they just, they enjoy their work and uh, do a much better job. What else? Yes? So do you think that providing your reentry program with the residential treatment program would be more most effective? Um, you know, the thing about our, our residential treatment program, those are folks with mental health issues, some very serious, and so until we can stabilize them, um, the re-entry is just kind of, just too much. And so, uh, our, what we try and do is get them stabilized to the point where we can get them in the general population, and then they can get the re-entry uh, information that they, that they need, but they do need to be successfully treated. First, we have some of those facilities, they'll never, they'll never leave there, so many. I, I gotta tell you, um, you know, the way America treats the mentally ill in the criminal justice system is disgusting. Um, when I first got to Colorado, my deputy handed me a form and she said, I need you to sign this. I said, what is it? Well, in Colorado, if the state mental hospital has someone that's too violent, um, they send them to us. They said, have they ever been convicted of a crime? Nope. How many do we have? Well, if you sign this one, it'll be number five. And I said, how old is he? Well, they can't send him to us until he's 18. He just turned 18. Now, he's a big 18-year-old. And had been in and out of institutions all his life. His dad used to take him to bars when he was 15 to fight for money. And on the, on the form was a yes, no box. And I said, what happens if I check no? And she said, no one's ever done it. I said, give me a pen. And I checked no. And kind of goes through the different bureaucracies. And a couple days later, my phone started ringing. And I was told, you can check no a thousand times. You still got to take it by law. So we did. Now, the trouble with taking a patient and putting them into a prison is that they're no longer patients, they're inmates, because that's what we do. And he had the mind of about a four-year-old. Four-year-olds don't follow directions very well. So he ended up in solitary. And then because he wasn't following directions in solitary, following the discipline and stair-stepping, he was being gassed two to three times a day to get him to behave, which he couldn't. So what I was able to do was working with the governor's office, the ACLU, and some legislators, we were finally able to ban that practice by law. We were one of five states, there's still some states that had that law. You know what, those five are doing just well, it's just fine in the state mental hospital. And uh, you know, those are the types of things you have to watch out for in, in bureaucracies. You know, I had that same professor, we were watching a therapy group at the seriously mentally ill prison. And I'm looking at these guys, and they're off the planet. I mean, they, and I'm thinking to myself, how can they possibly be in prison? Knowing they have done some horrific things. And I was thinking that silently, and the professor said, you know, they're probably safer here than in the community. And I said, well, you're right, that's a sad statement for America. What else? Yes? So you mentioned that you had the people who were children when they came in and yeah. they got life without parole, and now you have know, training through the virtual reality to how to, you know, like interact with society, are they like being trained so they can be let out even though they're sentenced to life? Yeah, here's what's happening with that. It's, it's a little bit complex, but the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court said unconstitutional. 
you have to at least give them the opportunity to be eligible for parole. So the state legislature enacted a law that allowed that. But, and what they passed in the statute was, first you have to have served 40 years. And then you have to go through a program that's dictated by corrections. And if you're successful in that, then you can be eligible to go before the parole board. The first case that came up, the state district court said, or circuit court said, no, unconstitutional, not doing it. So then I had to go back to the whole process and now it's back to where it was originally the whole term. So, and the answer to your question is we don't have any that, that have been out here. You know, it gets into the, and I don't know how you think about it, how much time's enough time? Or how much time isn't enough time? In Norway, the longest period of time you could spend in prison, except for some extremely exigent circumstances, is 20 years. You know, I've talked to a number of these 16, 17 year old gentlemen uh, that are now in their 50s. I mean, we all know they aren't the same person that committed that crime, they just aren't. Um, I feel very comfortable around them. I know a good number of them could be let out today and be very productive citizens. We use them a lot as mentors in our in our system. What else? Yes. Yeah. How do you trust someone? How do you find that you can trust Um well if I totally trusted inmates I wouldn't have those two gentlemen standing in the back of the room there. Um, unlike your grades, they get an A or an F every day. If I'm alive at the end of the day they get an A. You know what the F is? I get a death threat every three months. That's average for five and a half years. Trust? Uh, I tend to be one that uh, I'll trust until they show me that I shouldn't. I mean, I don't, you know, in this business, if you don't believe people can change, uh, you're really in the wrong business. So uh, we've got offenders that are remarkable. I mean, we, we have a program called Defy, and it's not our program. It's a group that um, works in other states, and they come in and they say, you know, you've got a lot of entrepreneurs in your system, and we do. It's just they were running the wrong business. And, you know, whether it be drugs or property or whatever, but what they do is they come in and they have a fairly large group of uh, offenders. I think the last class was about 70. And a lot of business folks in the communities volunteer as part of this and they come in. And it's a lengthy program, I think nine months, um, teaching them business skills. And then at the end, they set up these grants where they, um, some can get a $25,000 grant to, to get a business loan. Well, they came in and when they first gave the presentation, I was president of the governor, and uh, they gave the presentation, and I had heard them give it before, so this was the second round for me, and I was kind of uh, So when they were done, the governor goes, well, I kind of like it, Rick, what do you think? Well, I'm not stupid. I said, well, governor, but yeah, you know, if you like it, I like it, so uh, we did it. And, uh, I said, but if you're going to do it, do it at our maximum security prison. It's one of the prisons you pick. And let's see if you, if you can walk the talk. And they did, and the results were amazing. Um, watching these previous violent, high-risk offenders buying into this program and really doing well is, is amazing. So, you know, a lot of them, uh, Denver Jail did a study that 50% of those in their jail had brain trauma. You know, we, we need to we need to start looking at this for the criminal justice people. I got I got to tell you, when I am walking.
come in the arena of the criminal justice world and someone says we need to think outside the box, I almost start to gag. We don't need to think outside the box. We need a new box. The criminal justice system is set up to do exactly what it is doing right now. Punish people. That's what it is. Catch them and punish them. And I'll tell you, this is a really, you don't want to commit a crime in this state. It's tough. Really tough. I was reading, uh, getting out of the Springs Gazette here, I would read this paper on Sunday, and then my executive staff team meeting every Monday morning, I would read sentences until I got so sick of it, I quit, I quit doing it. Uh, but let me give you a couple of examples. Let's see, there was a county jail inmate that spit twice on a deputy. Now, I've been a deputy and I've been spit on, and it is degrading as heck. And because of that, I believe in every state now that's a felony. So this person spit twice on a deputy, nine years in prison. Now, how about if you take that spitter, and I have to assume probably had some mental health issues, and have him clean bathrooms in a homeless shelter for a year. Because he's coming out mad as heck after nine years, I guarantee you. I read another one where a person with no prior criminal record that I could find got in a mental meltdown standoff. Police were called. He fired 800 rounds at the police. Wow. Didn't hit anybody. Police fired two rounds back, didn't hit him. 752 years in prison. Almost a year for every round he fired. I had a high ranking elected official call me one day and say, Rick, I never really get involved in these, and I get all kinds of inmate requests and letters. He said, But I wonder if you look into this one. And I, I did. And it was a well known business person um, out of Denver, top firm, corporate executive, was at a Christmas uh, business Christmas party in Aspen. And he got drunk. And he got dead drunk. And he became an ass. And the manager said leave. And he got worse. So they called the police. Now depending on who you believe, and typically these will fall in the middle somewhere. Law enforcement says um, he tried to disarm him. And uh, the drunk's attorney said he was so drunk, as he was falling down, he grabbed onto the officer. He had to grab the gun. He didn't get the gun. Nobody got hurt. The, the company wanted him back. Ten years ago. My deputy told me one that when she was a warden at Arkansas Valley, saw this young woman, very young, walking, um, not Arkansas Valley, the female facility, uh, the name escapes me right now, but uh, walking through the yard, or Vista, walking through the yard, and said, who is that? Well, she was a cheerleader at one of the colleges, and they were playing, having a football, a rival football game coming up, and they, she and a couple of others stole their mascot stole the trailer to steal the mascot. The mascot was recovered, the trailer was recovered, she got eight years in prison. I mean, so those are the types of things really, you know, do we really need to do that? Is there something else we can do as far as having them help the homeless, work in the shelters, clean parks, do something? You know, we're, my, uh, executive team, I walked into a meeting and the parole director was talking about, yeah, we're probably going to have to revoke so-and-so. And I said, why? She's drunk every day. I said, what do you mean? Well, as soon as she wakes up in the morning, she starts drinking. And she drinks until she passes on. She's on parole. I said, did she drive? Does she drive? Nope. She refuses inpatient treatment, she refuses outpatient treatment, she won't live with her family out of state, and uh, she just keeps drinking. Does she commit any crimes? Nope. But
but she's missing meetings, of course, and not showing up when she should. And so the dilemma is, what do you do with it? So do you really take someone that's dead drunk, and we kind of use the term just a drunk, and not a criminal, and send them to prison? And those are some of the things that, that we deal with because there's no, there's no answers out there right now. The reason there's no answers you know, there's a myth out there that we deinstitutionalized mental health hospitals decades ago. It's true that we shut those mental health institutions down, but we didn't deinstitutionalize anything. All they did was start that walk from the mental health hospitals into the state prison system. Because Plan B was never enacted. And Plan B was once we shut those hospitals down, give the resources to the local communities to start their own mental health facility centers. It's never done. So there's no money. So they send them to prison. I mean, that's, that's our society. And those are the types of things that hopefully you, you can change. What else? Yes?
because of the socialization. Um, but there's all these different techniques to make these facilities more, more healthy. Um, regular, when I talk about regular tables and chairs, there's huge significance in that. When you look at what we have in our system, which is stainless steel stuff welded to the floor, you'll see artwork on the walls of European prisons. You'll see that in our prisons. Um, even the way the staff are treated. I go into a break room at, uh, in the Swedish prison, prison system, large screen TV, fully stocked kitchen, comfortable chairs, and I tell people, yeah, we have break rooms in our American prisons. We just have a different name for them. They're called control rooms, and you see a leader of Coke and a bag of Doritos sitting in them. You know, they're, they're working offices. And uh, if I were to try and build a room like they have, the legislators in this state would run me out of town on a rail, screaming that I'm wasting taxpayers' money. Uh, stop me if I told you this, but when Nils Olberg from Sweden was over here, he said, and this gets back into the corrections and efficiency I talked about. He goes, you know, Rick, do you mind if I send some of my union officials over here? And I said, no, why? He goes, well, we don't have hardly any assaults in the Navy. Don't. He said, but well, we had a fairly serious one a couple of months ago, and the union is demanding two to one step. Now that doesn't mean much to you here. But I can tell you that if you were to go to one of my prisons, Arkansas Valley, and you were to go into a dining hall, you would see probably over 200 inmates being fed with two correctional officers in there. Now who do you think the mentors are in that group? Inmates on inmates. Who do you think the mentors are in Sweden when it's one on one staff? the staff and the results are tremendous. But because we incarcerate so many people, there isn't enough money in America to give American corrections one to one staff. Heck, give me one to ten. You know, I guarantee you we can do miracles with that. But the problem is is they're just being sent faster than faster than uh, they can go out the door. And a lot of them, my, my, the female population, for instance, a good number of them are there for drug violations. You know, you get caught in most states, including Colorado, with Schedule One drug, heroin, meth, cocaine. You get caught three times, just possession. Yeah, I'll be open the door for you. So we're sending drug addicts to prison. Is that really the right place to be put? And then I also say that 99% in my mind of the reason women are sent to us is because of men. Because of the emotional abuse, the lack of self-esteem, the physical abuse. If you're gonna get in that car and you're gonna drive it right over here, and by the way, once I get over there, I'm gonna kill someone she's going to prison as an accessory for, for life. That's, that's our system. So, now, now that I've kind of just completely bummed you out about everything, uh, <laughs> the fact of the matter is, this is an exciting time to be in the criminal justice system. Because a lot of great things are happening right now, uh, particularly in corrections. It's the most progressive bunch of people I've, I've seen trying to internally solve the problem that there aren't a lot of people helping us to sell them, so we're doing it ourselves. Lots of new programming, lots of new ideas. You know, I have Michigan, uh, Heidi Washington there has taken a few units in her prison and turned them into what she calls vocational villages. Those vocational villages, they take offenders, put them in those units, they teach them job skills, they stay in that unit, they work together, they live together, get jobs and you know, the assault rates in, in those types of units are just going to see. So there's a lot of, a lot of great stuff. I just got notice the other day that Colorado Department of Corrections is number sixth in the nation 
for GED graduations. That's incredible. That's just, I, the staff is great that does that. Absolutely. Because most, like I say, have to live out without a diploma. You know, and I'll show you how far behind we were. When I first got here, the number of offenders that left the prison with a legitimate state ID, if I recall correctly, was less than 30%. Go for a week without an ID. See what happens. Keep going. Try and open a bank account with a sterling prison ID and see how many red buttons are being punched at the time that you want to and the reason is, under the Federal ID Act, you have to get through so many hoops to get a legitimate ID. You need a birth certificate to get a social security number. And a lot of our offenders have no idea what county they were born in. And birth certificates are, are all local ones. And so what we did was we put offices in a couple of our prisons. And now, um, to help them, almost immediately decided to get legitimate state IDs. Now about 90% go out with uh, the IDs. You know, the legalization of marijuana has helped us. And the reason it's helped us, I've had major employers say, we can't find employees. The reason we can't find employees is because our insurance company demands a drug-free workforce and we can't find them. And my response is, Hire our parolees because not only are they drug free, we test them for you for nothing. And so uh, we're doing very well in the job market. With our, with our parolees. Anything else? Yeah. I have a lot of questions. Um, so a while ago, you were talking about how there's a different rates of men in prison, but you know the different rates of men and women in solitary confinement. Yeah, I, I do because we have no women in solitary confinement. We um, we ban them, and because uh, women are so much different than men, um, you know we're we're rewriting our policies now to be gender specific, and uh, you know research shows women are much more social than men. A lot of our women have children. So if you cut off that contact via phone or whatever, um, now you've got kind of another victim on your hands because the, the child can't talk to the mother. Um, certainly for those in states that put pregnant women into solitary, um, the harm there is, is, is shocking. So uh, what we do have, if a woman is involved in a violent incident, um, and we find we need a cool off period, We'll put them in an individual cell, a solitary type cell. They'll get things in there with them, but um, the max is 72 hours, and if there's any reason that they want to keep her in there longer, they need the direct permission from my deputy executive director. So um, we made a lot, of, a lot of strides in that area. But what I tried to do is um, I wanted to have a uh, mother infant unit and have those that come in pregnant uh, keep the baby for, for two years. And the average length of stay for our female offenders, and, and that's the lifers and those in there for a short period of time, is about two and a half years. So I naively thought that female inmates coming in pregnant, the majority of them gave them up for adoption. Uh, when we did a little research and took a look at our at our numbers, we found that most of them gave them to their family members. Well, when I ran the Wisconsin system, I was in a female facility, and at that time there was a grandmother, a mother, and a daughter, all doing time for different crimes. And so it was my hope to break that cycle. Um, I thought a couple of good things would happen. One, we could teach the mother not just good skills, vocational skills, but we could teach her how to be a good mother, and the baby would get good nutrition and good health care. And 
the bonding uh, which I was hoping would take place would have that mother do everything possible to see that baby out of the system. Uh, unfortunately, we're so full right now that I, I have no room to do that, so I fell off the female incarceration rate nationally over the last decade has gone up about eight. Uh, we were way behind that statistic, but now with the opioid crisis, we're seeing that uh, that's a growing population. So, you know, and there's those that are dead set against that because of what I just talked about, because they don't want us as a culture accepting prison to the point where we're sending babies into a prison system. And then, so, you know, I tend to think the good outweighs the bad, but uh, um, there's a little bit of big so. One last question, if anybody's got one. Yes? Get out of your life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, uh, the, the problem with these positions is if you're going to be a placeholder, you can stay out of the paper, you're not going to get attacked, but I'm not a placeholder. And, you know, to have my daughter ask me, what were they writing about you in the, in the Denver Post and what was that all about? Well, and then you have to explain, well, one was all about BS. But that's what happens when you're in this position. So um, I, I say that because what I was hoping these last couple of months is um, to run around the state and thank the employees. You know, we have 20 prisons throughout Colorado and parole offices. And thank those that have done a fantastic job. Because every day it seems like my best plans no matter what I want to do, someone throws a hand grenade in my office every day, and I got to deal with it. That I'm kind of stuck close to close to home right now. But uh, you know, I'm still nationally spreading the word on our reforms. I want to keep that going. I don't want that to stop. I, I just think it's it's too important. I'm trying to get my executive team, even if they no longer are an executive team when the new governor starts because we're all appointed, uh, we uh, work at the whim of the governor, um, is to try and get them to really start focusing on that architectural suffering issue. You know, I, well, what you don't know is that people in my position, our professional lifespan, if you ever want to do what I'm doing for you, our professional lifespan is two and a half years. Then we get fired. And we get fired because there's bad people that do bad things and somebody's got to be held accountable for it. And would be me. And, uh, but I've been here five and a half years now, so I figure I'm on bonus time. I can do anything I want. Um, so anyway, so just to finish up a few projects, I, I, the more we can humanize these prisons, I think the better off as a society we are. And I will also always be a loud voice against mass incarceration.